Good morning. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We'll begin reading in verse 9 concerning the work of the Holy Spirit. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of men the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which men's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Let us pray. Father in heaven, during this time I do pray that you open up our hearts and minds to hear, to comprehend, to receive this word that you may receive all glory, honor, and praise. Our desire is that you would be pleased with our worship. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. We'll be teaching today on the revelation, the inspiration, and the illumination of the Holy Spirit, as described in the text that we just read. The text that we just read tell us how divine revelation was made known to the apostles by the Holy Spirit, how in turn they passed on that revelation to us by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and how we understand that revelation by the illumination of the Holy Spirit. I want everybody to notice how this passage begins. In verse 9, it's a reference directly to Isaiah 64, verse 4. And this will set the context for us. But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. The context is always so important, so we need to get right down to the context. This passage of Scripture is taken from Isaiah 64, verse 1 through 4, and that portion of Scripture is a plea for God to reveal Himself as He had done in earlier days. A plea for God to reveal himself as he has done in earlier days. Moses wrote of that day in Deuteronomy 10, verse 21. He says, He is thy praise. 
And he is thy God that hath done for thee those great and terrible things that thine eyes have seen. God had revealed himself to the Jewish people in the days of Moses and Joshua. He had done miraculous deeds in the land of Egypt. He had revealed himself on Mount Sinai with the giving of the law. He had led the Jews through 40 years of wilderness wandering. We need to look at Isaiah 64, 1 through 4. It says, Oh, that you would rend the heavens. That means, Oh, that you would reveal yourself to us again. Oh, that you would rend the heavens. That you would come down. Reveal yourself. That the mountains might shake at your presence as fire burns brushwood, as fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, that the nations may tremble at your presence. God, reveal yourself again. When you did awesome things which we did not look for, you came down, the mountain shook at your presence. He's saying, God, you did it before, do it again. This is a reference, a direct reference of the appearance of God on Mount Sinai. When God came down upon the mountain, and the mountain shook in his presence. From Exodus 19, verse 18, and Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mountain quaked greatly when God revealed himself. From Exodus chapter 20, verse 18. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. The people said to Moses, you speak to us and we'll listen to you. But let not God speak to us lest we die. When you did awesome things for which we did not look, you came down. The mountain shook at your presence. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, nor has the eye seen any God besides you, who acts for the one who waits for him. Paul refers to Isaiah 64, 4 to speak of the direct revelation that God had imparted to his apostles. In the same manner in which God had revealed himself in earlier days, he had revealed himself to the apostles and those who wrote the New Testament. Isaiah 64, 6 is prophetic. God revealed in the New Testament what was previously a mystery in the Old. And that is literally what the next verse says. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. It speaks of truth that had been revealed for the first time in the New Testament. 
And I want everybody to know this is much the same message that the Apostle Paul gave in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1 through 7, when he writes about the mystery of the church. Now the church was in previous ages unknown, but it was made known now to the sons of men. Paul writes about that which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of man, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and his prophets by the Spirit. These mysteries have been made known to the holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit of God. Amen? Amen. Verses 9 through 11 of the text we're looking at today speak of divine revelation. I have not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Literally says that our eyes, our ears, and our mind are not sufficient to receive divine truth on their own. Only through the Holy Spirit can a person receive divine revelation? This verse says that God's truth is not able to be discovered by the human eye, ear, or mind because it is revealed by God himself. And that's the point being made in the next verse which teaches that God's wisdom is made known only through the Holy Spirit. But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Notice God hath revealed them unto us. Who is us? In context, again, this is very important. This is speaking of Paul and the apostles. God had revealed them unto Paul and the other apostles. God disclosed his saving truth to the apostles. He revealed the deep things, the things which God had prepared for them that loved him. Because the Holy Spirit is God, He knows the deep things of God. These truths from the Old Testament were made known to the apostles of the New Testament because He understands the truth of God. He is able to impart that truth to others. That is what the Holy Spirit of God does. On the night before his crucifixion, it is important to recognize that Jesus taught his apostles about the work of the Holy Spirit. Let's look at John 14, 26, for instance, if you would all turn there. On the night before his crucifixion, Jesus taught his apostles about the work of the Holy Spirit. He says in John 14, 26, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. What's that mean? That means that the Holy Spirit taught the apostles. He will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Again, the Holy Spirit taught the apostles. Notice that it was the Holy Spirit that brought all things to the remembrance of the apostles. The Holy Spirit brought all things that Christ had taught them 
to their remembrance. And everything that was brought to their remembrance was recorded in Scripture. John 15, verse 26 and 27. In case you haven't picked up on it yet, this is another plug for the Bible. We ought to be reading it, studying it, learning it, applying it to life. John 15, verse 26 and 27. Jesus said, but when the Comforter is come, he shall testify of me. And ye also shall bear witness because ye had been with me from the beginning. Notice very clearly, the Holy Spirit testifies of Christ. And Jesus said that he, the Holy Spirit, will testify of me, Jesus. And you, the apostles, shall also bear witness to that testimony. And is it not true that the apostles still bear witness to that testimony today through the words that are written in Holy Scripture? From John 16, verse 14 and 15, Jesus again teaching his apostles about the work of the Holy Spirit. He says, He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine, therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. Notice the following. The Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus. He took that which is of Jesus and revealed it to the apostles. And the apostles recorded it in Scripture. They recorded what the Spirit revealed about Christ. The Holy Spirit revealed to the apostles those things that the eye had not seen. Those things that the ear had not heard those things that the mind had not conceived of, God revealed them to the apostles. Amen? Amen. Verse 11. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. No one knows what someone else is thinking. It's hidden. You may try to guess, but you can never know for certain what someone is thinking. Unless, that is, that they reveal it to you. Therefore, we know what God's thinking. Because God revealed it to the apostles. And the apostles turned around and revealed it to us. Praise the Lord. Verse 12 and verse 13 speak of divine inspiration. It talks about how the word of God was divinely inspired. And we're going to see that mostly in verse 13, but first let's look at verse 12. Now we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we may know the things that are freely given to us of God. Notice again, we have received the spirit of God that we may know those things that are freely given to us 
the we and the us refers to Paul and the other apostles who wrote the New Testament. They received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. In other places, Scripture tells us unequivocally that the Word of God is divinely inspired. Second, Th Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That means literally translating the word theonousis, Inspiration means it's God-breathed, spoken by God. We're going to see more of that later. But all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Doctrine refers to teaching. The word of God is profitable for teaching because it's the word of God. It's profitable for reproof. That means for bringing conviction, conviction of sin. It's profitable for correction, to put us back on the right road when we stray off of it. It's profitable for instruction in righteousness, which literally means receiving the direct instruction of God from God. Peter writes the same thing in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private origin. For prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost says literally that the Word of God was given by the Holy Spirit of God. It is of no private origin because it originates with God Himself. The Word of God is not the will of man. It is not in, in accord with the precepts of man. The Word of God is from the Holy Spirit of God. And just to make sure and everybody understands this, the Holy Spirit of God is the Spirit of Christ. From 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 11, we see that the prophets of old spoke according to the Spirit of Christ that was in them. They were led by the Holy Spirit, which is the Spirit of Christ. Scripture is given by the Holy Spirit. It's God-breathed. We're going to see that in verse 13. Notice verse 13 says, Which things also we speak. What things? When the Bible makes a statement like that, you got to figure out what he's talking about. What things, which things we also speak. Well, it's reference back to verse 12. Things that had been freely given to us by God. Things that have been freely given to us by God through the Holy Spirit of God. Is what he's talking about. Which things also we speak. Notice this. Not in words which man's wisdom teaches. But which the Holy Ghost teaches. Literal inspiration right here. 
that the apostles wrote down exactly what God said. The Holy Spirit is God. The Bible is divinely inspired. The people who wrote the Bible wrote down precisely what God said. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. The apostles spoke the word of God according to the spirit of God and they used spirit-given words. Notice it says not in the words of man's wisdom. They didn't speak with words of man, with man's wisdom. They spoke in words that were taught by the Holy Spirit. That's what it says. Meaning, quite simply, that the words that were used in the original text were the very words of God. You know what that tells me? The Bible is totally trustworthy. It tells me that you can believe it from cover to cover. The expression carrying, comparing spiritual things with spiritual means to teach spiritual truths with spirit-given words. Paul is saying that the process of inspiration involves the conveying of divine truth with words that are chosen for that purpose by the Holy Spirit The NASB says it's combining spiritual thoughts with spirit-given words, spiritual words. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual, those things that are taught by the Holy Spirit. Paul expressed spiritual truth with spirit-given words. In 1 Corinthians 2, Verse 6 through 8, right before the passage of Scripture we're looking at today. This is what he wrote. Howbeit we speak wisdom among those that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world. Not the wisdom of this world. Nor are the princes of this world that have come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God. In a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for if they had have known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Paul speaks the wisdom of God. He speaks mysteries that were previously hidden and now revealed. Verses 14 through 16 speak of divine illumination. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit, Receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. The natural man is an obvious reference to those who are unsaved, those who have not received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, those who are not illuminated by the Holy Spirit of God, it needs to be known that the natural man is inherited from Adam. 
as Romans 5.12 puts it, through one man sin entered the world and death through sin and thus death spread to all men because all have sinned. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, the natural man is dead in trespasses and sins. And life at this level is void of spiritual illumination because life at this level is void of the Holy Spirit of God. The natural man is unregenerate. Spiritual truth is not important to the one who is unsaved. The natural man can be said to be concerned with this life in this world. The natural man doesn't want the things of God. The natural man lives as if there is no hell, no condemnation, no judgment. The natural man lives as though there's nothing beyond this life. The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit. They are foolishness to him because they are spiritually discerned. Literally means that the natural man has no spiritual illumination. So unless one is born of the Spirit, taught by the Spirit, the things of the Spirit are foreign to him. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things. Yet he himself is judged of no man. The one who is spiritual judges all things because of the illumination of the Holy Spirit. He judges all things. Because of the illumination of the Holy Spirit he thinks biblically. He can discern scripture. So he can judge all things. To the world, this person is probably an enigma. He probably seems rather peculiar. The natural man, the one we just talked about, he judges based on secular psychology. He judges based on secular philosophy. The spirit illuminated man can judge all things by standards that are far above the wisdom of man. Notice it says, yet he himself is judged of no man. That means quite simply that God is his judge. It is true that God is everybody's judge. But he himself is judge of no man because God is his judge. God has saved his soul. God has given him the Holy Spirit of God. The unsaved person may see the believer's faults, may see the believer's shortcomings. But what they cannot see and what they cannot understand because they have not the Holy Spirit. 
They cannot understand that believers are sinners who are saved by grace. I'm going to say that again. The unsaved may see the believer's faults and shortcomings. But what they cannot see is the believers are sinners saved by grace. They don't understand such a thing. They can't judge correctly the one who is saved. The natural man is not equipped to judge the one who is saved because he cannot understand. He is void of spiritual illumination. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him but we have the mind of Christ. Paul is probably referring to Isaiah 40, verse 13, where it is written, Who hath directed the Spirit of the Lord? Or being his counselor, who hath taught him? With whom took he counsel? And who directed, instructed him, and taught him the, in the path of judgment? And taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? To ask the question is to answer it. God cannot be known through the wisdom or power of men. He is known only as he chooses to make himself known. However, those who have the mind of Christ are able to understand that. We have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ, who is God in the flesh. We have the Holy Spirit because of the gift of Christ. Illumination is given only to those who place their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. The Holy Spirit is thus given to those who are redeemed by the blood of Christ. There's another work of the Holy Spirit that we must cover today. And that is the work of the Holy Spirit in salvation. Without the Holy Spirit, salvation would be impossible. On the night of the crucifixion, Jesus spoke of the work of the Holy Spirit as we've already seen. And he encouraged his apostles in John 16, verse 7 through 11, if we could turn there. He encouraged his apostles with these words. Beginning with John 16, 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me of righteousness because they go to my father and you see me no more of judgment 
because the prince of this world is judged. The comforter is the parakletos. He is the helper. One who comes along beside the believer and helps him in this life. That would have been a great comfort to the apostles on the night before Christ's crucifixion. But notice what it says the comforter does. When he comes, he will reprove the world of sin. Reprove translate a word that means to convict. To convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment. It's the Spirit of God that works on the hearts and the minds of unbelievers to convict them of sin. Without the Holy Spirit's work, salvation is literally impossible. So the Holy Spirit convicts of sin. Sin is rebellion against God. We have to recognize that most people are not readily wanting to admit the guilt of sin. The work of the Holy Spirit is necessary to convict people of sin. Notice he convicts of righteousness. When the Jewish leadership had Christ crucified, the Jewish people showed that they thought he was unrighteous. Because only a wicked person, according to Deuteronomy 21, 23, would be hanged on a tree and be under God's curse. But the resurrection of Christ, the ascension of Christ, vindicated Christ and literally showed that he is God's righteous servant. As it's written in Acts chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. It is the Spirit of God that convicts men of their faulty views of Christ. And that happens when the gospel is proclaimed. Because the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. The Spirit convicts men of their faulty views of Jesus when the gospel is preached. The Spirit also convicts of judgment. The third area of the Holy Spirit's convicting work concerns judgment. The death and resurrection of Jesus was the condemnation of Satan. Was the condemnation of Satan. By Jesus' death, he defeated the devil who held the power of death. And though defeated at the cross, Satan is still active, yet he's on death row, awaiting the day when he's thrown into the lake of fire forever and ever. The Spirit of God convicts people of judgment by reminding them that Satan is defeated. Because those who are not saved are following the devil, whether they know it or not. People in rebellion, when they hear the gospel, that's the key. When they heard the gospel, 
they should take note of Satan's defeat. And they should come to fear the Lord who holds the power to judge. When the truth of coming judgment is preached, the Spirit convicts people and prepares their heart to be saved. So we've seen today, the scripture is divinely inspired. The word of God is truth. And Jesus said, if you abide in the word of God, you can be set free. The word of God is given by divine revelation, verses 9 through 11. God revealed himself through the Holy Spirit. The word of God was given by divine inspiration, verse 12 and 13. In transmitting God's revelation of himself to others, the apostles and writers of the Bible used words which the Holy Spirit taught them to use. The word of God is understood only by divine illumination. And only through the convicting power of the Holy Spirit can one be saved. Let us pray. Father in heaven, I do pray at this time that every person who has heard this message would examine their heart would examine their life before you, would examine whether or not that you are truly their Lord and Savior. Help us to recognize the importance of the Holy Spirit in giving us the Word of God. Help us to cherish your Word. Help us to love your word. Help us to read your word, to learn your word, to do your word. I pray in Christ's name. Amen.